goes like this. And then does this go? Oh, okay. Ooh. All right. Hey, you know what? All right, guys, why don't you have a seat? I, I, I have no idea whether I've got like lots of content or too few. Sit down, sit down, sit down. All right. All right, and I don't have a watch. Let's see. Let's see if I can recall. Okay, so I think we're going to start on time. All right, so we're going to talk to you about uh, PowerShell Core. I started to do this talk, and I realized, well, PowerShell Core, really, it's, it's really PowerShell. So I thought, well, you know, I could talk to you about that, and I will. Uh, but I thought what was more important was to talk about the why and to set the, the context, right? So I think if you take a look at Microsoft, currently we're doing lots of stuff, lots of stuff. And my goal for this talk was to kind of give you this sort of you are here, right? To give you some global perspective about what's going on. Because sometimes, you know, I like to uh, get, tell the talk, I don't know whether this translates to Europe, in America we have this joke about these two guys in the forest and, and, and all of a sudden this bear, they see this bear and the bear's going to attack them and eat them and they're going to make a run for it and the one guy stops he pulls off his backpack he takes out a pair of running shoes and he puts on his running shoes and his buddy says, Tom, I don't know what you think you're doing, but a grizzly bear can run 35 miles an hour there's no way you can outrun a grizzly bear, even with running shoes. And he says, well, Fred, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. Okay. <laughs> oh, it translated. Oh, good. I'm so pleased. Okay. Now, the point of that is that sometimes when you look at people and you see things and you're like, what are they doing? And their actions seem odd until you understand their motivations. So my goal is to communicate to you a global context so that you can understand why we do what we do and hopefully make more sense of it. So first, let's put some context. I'm Jeffrey Snover. That's my Twitter tag. If you want to follow me, I encourage you to. Um, I am now the chief architect of what's known as the Enterprise Cloud Group. Enterprise Cloud Group. So that is System Center, all the System Center products, the new operations management suite products, Windows Server and Azure. Pretty big job, okay? <laughs> and last year I was um, promoted to technical fellow. Now just to put this in context, Microsoft has over 100,000 employees. Microsoft earns, like last year I think we earned 92 and a half, 93 and a half billion dollars, 93 and a half billion dollars a year. So as a software company, I remember before this, like aspirations to become a billion dollar a year software company. We produce lots of those each year. I mean, Microsoft is a big company. So now, in this large company, uh, when I last looked, we had about 20 some odd technical fellows. Now, the vast majority of those are really vice presidents, uh, technical fellows with 700 people working for them or 300 people working for them. Only 11 are technical fellows like I am, which is to say an individual technical contributor. And of those, four of them um, are work in research. So we have only seven technical fellows that are working on products that are individual technical contributors. To put that in perspective, Microsoft has had a, a uh, Turing Award winners, which aren't technical fellows. So this is a pretty big deal. And now the reason why I point this out is not to brag. Okay, I'm bragging a little bit. But not, <laughs> that's not the point. That's not the point. Uh, the point is, what the heck? I mean, what the heck? Some guy who invented a shell it gets that? Like, how do you connect those dots, right? Because if you think about that, that's a, that's a little bit strange, right? How could, like, PowerShell elevate you to that position? Well, it's strange until you understand the context, and that's the point. So let's talk about the context. <clears throat> I was recently doing an interview with some guy who was going to write an article about the history of the server, and he wanted to know about feature when it came in. And so I was like, oh, I got a memory like a, like a cat, right? I just can't remember anything. And, uh, and so I was looking at Wikipedia, looking at when we introduced what, and like, none of that made any sense. And I stopped and did what architects do, right? Or my, my, my training in physics taught me, which is to say, 
Ignore the details. What's the big picture? What's, what's really going on here? And I realized that Windows Server had gone through a series of distinct eras. And you can't understand what we've been doing until you understand those eras. So let's talk about them. First off, we had the server for the masses, right? Windows NT. We took a GUI. We, put a, we took a server, a great OS kernel, Windows NT, thank you, David Cutler. We put a GUI on top of it, and we ran it on PC economics hardware. What a winner, what a winner. All of a sudden now, we took servers out of the glass rooms, and everybody could buy, install, and run their own server. Crazy success, crazy success. Changed the world. Changed the world, created a big problem. All these servers, how do, you, how do you get them to talk to one another, right? You got sneaker nets, you're trying to use the same password everywhere, and you got a gazillion clients. So that brought about the next era, the era of the enterprise servers. With Windows Server 2000, we introduced Active Directory, Group Policy, and we're able to take all these systems and bring them together and allow them to work in a coherent manner. Okay? With Windows Server 2003, we introduced .NET, and that started the LOB explosion, right? Where now everybody could write their own line of business applications. Huge explosion. Again, another problem. There are so many people still on Windows 2003 because there was such an explosion of these applications, okay? So, now, that brings another problem. There are so many of these line of business applications, now all of a sudden it's not just a couple servers, you got a bunch of servers. And so that brought about the third era, the era of data center servers, where we focused in some of these LOBs needed very large scale up applications, SQL. So you have very large systems, we did scale up, we started our scale out work, we added virtualization, and after a decade, almost a decade of, of uh, uninvestment, we rebooted our storage stack, okay? And our, did some great work on networking, but really rebooted our storage stack. And that was the technology. This data center server was the technology that enabled Windows Azure. And so now Azure brings about our fourth era, and that is cloud servers, where we're taking the technology, in some cases the direct code from Azure, often it's the lessons learned from Azure, and we're making them available, of course, in our public cloud, but now also to customers, okay? So we've gone through each one of these distinct errors, and the thing to be clear on is that each era is additive. Okay, so if you're one of the guys who love the idea of buying a server, giving it a big hug, attaching a keyboard, just love that mouse and you wanna plug the mouse into your server and get a big touch screen, touch screen and walk up to your server and say, server and say hey Cortana, start IIS. You're gonna be able to do that with Windows Server 2016. Yes, Windows Server 2016 is the world's first Cortana-enabled server. <laughs> it's true. It is true. No, it is true. Uh, because indeed, uh, you have server and a desktop. You have the, that available. And so each one of these things is additive, not replacing. However, it's interesting to think about this. Kenneth and I were talking over lunch, and I realized that, hey, you know, um, as you go and you talk to administrators, what you find is that each administrator came to, the, came to their skill set and came to their success during some, one of these eras. And some of the people, people in this room, have been able to go from one to the next to the next, but a bunch of people got stuck, right? There are a bunch of people who are like, well, what do you mean PowerShell? Those guys are stuck in the server for the masses era. Right? Uh, some people like, hey, uh, I can just do a little bit of this. They get stuck in the enterprise server era, okay? So what you wanna do is you don't wanna get stuck. I'm telling you this cloud thing is real. And let me tell you why I'm so optimistic about the cloud. All this stuff's great, 
right? We're technologists. What did I say earlier? We're technologists, but technology that matters is technology that yields an economic difference. And to me, that's the heart of the cloud. The heart of the cloud, the thing that gets me the most excited about the cloud is this transformation from IT, from just, a, well, I'm automating some process. I can save you money. I can save you money. I can save you money. Look, there's a maximal amount of money you can save, whatever you're spending. But with the cloud, we're transforming it. As an industry, we're finally getting good at being able to earn money with computing. And there's no maximal to that, okay? What is it, the WhatsApp, just install WhatsApp? What is that, they sell that company for $17 billion? They had like 15 people working on it? That's crazy, right? There's no maximum amount of money you can earn with, if you get it right. Okay? And so the point is, as an industry, we are finally getting good at turning computing into revenue. And when you do that, my friends, yeah, the checkbooks come out. Okay? That's why I'm so optimistic about it. Okay. So now let's talk about our server journey. As we've done this, we start off, we had Windows, Windows NT. It was really a desktop that we turned over on its side. I mean, you literally walk up to it and said, you know, control, alt, delete, okay? And then starting in Windows Server, when we started this data center, we realized, man, when we're gonna have lots of these servers, you can't be walking up to each one of them. Even if it's RDP, managing them as individual machines is not gonna work. Uh, we really need to get better at management, at remote management, and servers shouldn't have a GUI stack. That's just not a good thing to do. So we introduced Server Core, and at the time it was side by side. Now we made a lot of mistakes with Server Core, a lot of mistakes. We weren't clear about our scenarios, uh, we didn't have our management story in order, and oddly enough, we, we didn't have an SDK. I don't know if you knew that. Windows Server has never, has never had an SDK. How bizarre is that? It's a true story though. Now with Windows Server 2016, we have one. But as I recall, I said, like, what? This is the first time we've had an SDK? Anyway, so we've never had an SDK. Anyway, so we did that in this era. And then Server Core had limited adoption in that beginning days because we weren't clear about the technology, weren't clear about the scenarios, et cetera. It took a while to take off. And now it's doing quite well. Uh, and it is the basis of everything, right? So Server Core, you can add minimal server interface and you can add a GUI shell on top of that. And you can go back and forth in Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2. However, as we look at the cloud, Okay, as we look at the cloud, we realize that we need to be more cloud competitive. Again, what's the cloud about? The cloud's about earning revenue, right? It's about other things, but that's the one that really matters. Look, let me just stop. Here's the thing you got to get in focus, okay? The vast majority of computing is ahead of us not behind us, ahead of us, not behind us, well, whichever direction. It's ahead of us, right? Everything that we've done to date is all small potatoes. It's all small potatoes. Man, talk about Moore's curve, Moore's law, like that has nothing. It's about volume, right? Whether or not the CPUs get faster or not, or the per core CPU, we hit the wall with Moore's law, none of that matters. I'm telling you that the vast majority of computing is ahead of us, not behind us. And why is that? It's because we're able to finally turn this into revenue, right? With big data, uh, with you know, uh, machine learning, et cetera. That stuff consumes a ton of processing. So it's all ahead of it. So now the question is, okay, think out five, 10, 15 years. You're gonna have orders, many orders of magnitude, more servers that you need to control, that you need to be effective, that if it gets wrong, you interrupted a revenue stream, right? That's your world, that's the way it's, we're all gonna be. Okay, so in that world, you need to build it on something that is optimized for that world, right? You don't wanna say, well, you know, hey, it was good enough in, you know, 19, 89, I'll just use that same server. No, so Windows Nano Server was that deep rethink, that statement that said, hey, the world's computing, and by that I mean literally the world's computing, Rasinovich and I have these conversations, right? We grab coffee, we'd say, hey, what's gonna happen? At some point we hit upon this idea that, you know, project out with IoT and, you know, 20 years down the road, we believe that the vast majority of the world, 
Like the world's infrastructure is going to be running on computing, in particular public cloud computing, right? Global scale, etc. So the question is, boy, what does it take to make that right? Because anything that goes wrong now is no longer, oh, well, this application's down, uh, F5 doesn't work. All of a sudden, the operations of the world get disrupted. Okay, so that's the way we're thinking about it. And we decided we needed an operating system which reflected that, okay? So that, what do you need to be cloud friendly? You need to be super small and super fast. Uh, you need to be DevOps friendly and you min need to minimize the attack surface. I don't know how many of you saw the, the uh, uh, Empire today. Boy, that was scary stuff. Uh, well, here's the thing. If you haven't installed a component, you don't have any risks, right? Now, why would you not install a component? If you're not using it, don't install it. If you're using it, you're getting value out of it, and so it's worth the risk. But if you're not using it, don't install it. And you want to minimize patches and reboots. So this is sort of the heart and soul of the motivation for nano server. So nano server is our next step in the cloud journey. So what's that mean? Okay. It is a headless deployment option for Windows Server. Okay. It is not a new SKU. It's not a different th other thing. It is a dramatic refactoring of Windows Server and it's a deployment option. You buy Windows Server, you say, hey, would I like to install A, B, or C? One of those is Nano Server. So it's a deep refactoring. This initial version is focused in on really two scenarios. First is cloud OS infrastructure. So this is the stuff we're gonna put on the physical servers themselves that are gonna run the cloud, right? It needs to be small, fast weight, secure as all heck. Right? So what's that translate to? Translates to clustered hypervisor and clustered storage and some networking roles. Next is it's focused in on born in the cloud applications. People are going to build new applications for the cloud. They're going to build it on nano server and they're going to have great semantics. Okay? So we have things like ASP.NET Core, uh, uh, .NET Core, IIS, and Service Fabric will be available on there. And of course, containers. Containers will also be supported. Now, server core and server and a desktop, server with a desktop, I like to refer to it as server and a desktop because it makes me sad. It makes me sad. Des oh, never mind. Anyway, so server and a desktop, that's still available. If you want to install that, have your Cortana enabled server, you bet that's there. Um, uh, but again, it's a deployment option. You pick whatever SKU you have, and we change those SKUs around. So in the past, it was data center and standard. I don't know what it'll be in this next version. Maybe it's the same, maybe it'll be different. But whatever SKU you buy, you'll say, I'd like server and a desktop version of that, I'd like server core version of that, or I'd like the nano server version. In this version, it's a deployment option. Now here, uh, we're recapitulating what we did with server core. We start off, it's a separate model, right? You pick one or the other, and one is not built upon the other. That may change in the future, may not, we'll see. Um, but what you will see, however, is that we start off here, and then this stuff will get refactored and be more and more optional components on top of that. The real question is, will we ever take this GUI and put it on top of that. My guess is probably not. We'll probably keep that built this way. You can. You can go from server core. Mm. Uh, so the question is, hey, is that current? Can you go from server core to GUI shell? Oh, you know what? Um, we are still, here's, <laughs> who cares, right? We are in the process of redoing our engineering system at Microsoft, right? So the cloud comes at a quicker pace, everything's moving quicker. What we said was to do move quicker and be more agile, we need to do our redo our engineering system. Now, none of you care about that, but I'll tell you it has a dramatic effect on things. So there's, we're changing the way we do check-ins, we're changing the way we do builds, we're changing the way the uh, developers interoperate with each other, and part of that is there is a new deployment option, set of options. So how this will work in Windows Server 2016, how it works in the end, is yet to be written, okay? 
the previous t uh, technology preview, you were not able to go from server core to full server. Um, a new technology preview is coming out shortly, and then there'll be the final release. We'll talk at the end of the final release, see what we get. Okay, so the nano server roles and features. Now, uh, here we have what's called a zero footprint model. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a server and you say, I'd like to install IIS, it does not say, please insert the disk. Why is that? And the answer is, we already have the software on the machine, okay? Everything is put in what's called a side-by-side -side directory. And when you say, install Windows Server, we just say, it's over there, make it available over here. Okay, um, that's how it works. That's why you don't need to install the software. That's why the images are so large. One of the reasons why the images are so large. That's an incredible amount of space being consumed by that stuff. That is not the way it will work with Nano Server. Nano Server will be a zero footprint model. So as you install roles and, and features, you will add them, uh, you'll have to provide the media for them. And you'll install them just like you would an application. And there's a new installer mode there. Okay, I mentioned to you the key roles and features. Hypervisor, scale up file server, clustering, DNS, IIS, and then that's for the fabric. And then for the application development, you got .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, um, service fabric. The drivers are the same. The drivers are the same. Now, some manufacturers have included, their, their installation program has a GUI. We're working with those guys to say, hey, McFly, maybe you didn't get the memo. No GUIs on servers. Stop doing that. Um, and so we're going to get them to stop doing that. Uh, Annie Malware. So Annie Malware Defender is now an optional component in all of Windows Server. In the past, it wasn't. In the past, it was an add-on that you had to purchase. Now it's available in everything. And it turned out when we did this, um, we, we blew up all these uh, uh, performance gates. Uh, 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 it's too slow, too slow, startup's too slow. And we drilled in, like, what's going on here? And it's like, oh, okay, hey, we need to optimize this. We need to optimize this. This needs to change. This needs to change. And so now it runs just great. And I thought, well, wait a second, before you had to pay for it. What the heck? And <laughs> so anyway, now it's free and much faster. Okay. And by the way, it's one of the benefits of being part of the engineering system of Windows is you get all those gates applied to you, and it really just drives higher quality. And of course, the System Center and Apps Insight agents will be available as well for Nano Server. All right. Now, great stuff. Is it? Is it? I mean, great story, but is it real? Now, these numbers that I'm about to show you uh, will change, right? Uh, these are interim numbers, uh, and some of them will go get better, some will get worse. Um, so we'll see where we are. So what we did was we analyzed the amount of you know, services, patches, on a particular year's worth of code. And then we said, hey, if, that if we had a nano server, would that have applied? Okay? And what we found was that with, with full server, one year we had 26 important bulletins. Server core had 23, so not that much of a difference. Uh, but for nano server, we only would take nine. So that's a pretty substantial reduction in important patches. Oh, gosh. Don't look. <laughs> Don't look. However, when you then said, well, which were the critical ones, you see it's almost tenfold reduction. Uh, one tenth the number of critical patches uh, applied to nano server. So that's really important. And of course, that is not a one-to-one -one translation to reboots, but the reboots were about a quarter what they were for uh, full server. So these are really important things. Now, when you take a look at security improvements, the number of drivers loaded, we go from almost 100 to almost 70, so substantial reduction in the number of drivers. The number of services running by default goes from 46 down to 22, again, less than one half. And the number of ports open available for exploitation go from 31 down to 12. So a real significant reduction in the surface. Now, resource utilization, process count goes down a little, 26 down to 21. The number of IOs, number of megabytes required to boot a system goes from 255 to 150. You might say, hey, why do you care about that? Think about this, you start a hypervisor, 
What do you do when you start a hypervisor? Starting a hypervisor is not interesting whatsoever. Starting all the VMs is interesting. So you start a hypervisor, you start all the VMs. When can you start using those VMs? Well, your throttling component to availability of your VMs is going to be your storage subsystem. How many IOs can you deliver to get that VM, those VMs up and running? If the VMs reduce the number of IOs they need to boot, guess what? Quicker availability. So that's, what that's, that's why we're tracking that number. And look at this, kernel memory. The kernel memory is less than one half. It goes from a, almost 140 to 61 megabytes. Again, these numbers were changed, but these are very compelling numbers. And by the way, now think of this, right? So for any particular server, go back there, back, back. Yeah. For any particular server, you say, well, you know, what, 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 who cares? I got a lot of memory, why do I care? The answer is again, the future of computing is ahead of us. This is not optimizing a machine. This is about saying, hey, how am I gonna have 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 systems that I fire up, am able to use quickly, and then tear down and get the right level. So it's about mass management. And guess what? Uh, even small numbers times large number of instances translates into lots of cogs, lots of memory, lots of agility. So it's all about mass management. Deployment improvements, check this out, right? This is where you wanna put your seatbelts on, okay? Deployment setup time goes from 300 seconds down to 40, 40 seconds, okay? Disk footprint goes from about five gigabytes down to about 300 and VHD size goes from about six gigabytes down to 440. So the way this actually translates to server and a desktop, remember it makes me sad, server and a desktop. Sad, sad, sad is about uh, nine to 10 gigabytes. Server core is about five or six. Nano server, about 440 megabytes. Incredible size reduction. And again, that's sort of the base. If you need a gigabyte's worth of stuff to get your application running, great, we're gonna go from 440 to a gigabyte. You need three gigabytes, that's fine, we'll go from that to that. But those are the components that you use, right? If you use them, that's great. If you don't use them, I mean, that was the thing that struck me. It struck me, it was like, hey, it's one thing to say, I'm using this component, that component has a critical patch, I need to take that critical patch, and I need to reboot the server to make sure that I'm secure. We can all get our heads around that. But what just struck me as profoundly unfair and unjust, I mean, really almost moralistic terms, was all of a sudden, I have to reboot my, my service because I'm taking a patch to a component that I'm not using. But guess what? It's on the system. You still have to patch it and you still have to reboot the system, even if you're not using it. So don't, if you're not using it, you don't install it, you don't have that. Great. But how do you manage this thing? Right? You say, well, why is that an interesting question? It's an interesting question because there is no full CLR. I told you that Nano Server had .NET Core. It does not have the full desktop CLR. PowerShell is a full desktop CLR uh, management system. So how are we gonna manage that? And there's a couple of answers. So the first, you saw some of it today, is the remote server management tools. Remote server management tools are a new web-based set of tools that fit into the Ibiza portal framework. Uh, that's the Azure portal framework. Uh, and it provides now web replacement for a bunch of tools that used to be local only, okay? So task manager, the registry editor. Fortunately, I don't have, my networking's broken. I would love to show you this. You have the registry editor in a web browser. How crazy is that? Okay, uh, we added device manager. Now device manager works remotely in a web browser. Uh, replacement for S config, a number of control panel elements. You have performance counter, disk management, users, file explorer, all of this running in a web browser. Okay, now let me be clear. A lot of people misunderstand what I say. I love GUIs. I love GUIs. GUIs are great, but not on a server. They're great on a client. So if you want to do a GUI, that's awesome, but you want to do it against a, a, on a client, against a server, and you want to use formal remote management APIs so that you can automate it. 
In the past, what we had was a lot of local GUIs calling private APIs, which meant that one, you couldn't scale, and two, you couldn't automate, okay? Next, so remote server managing tools. This is where I show you a demo that doesn't work because I don't have a network card. But this is what it looks like. So this is the Ibiza portal, managing tools, connect to something. This will work against anything, right? This will work against Azure, against Active Direct, or sorry, against AWS. It'll work against uh, machines in the cloud or on premises. There's a gateway server that you install. That gateway server connects up to the cloud, pulls requests, and then dispatches them to the local machine. Very efficient. So you see here, you have essentials, you have a set of tools, including an interactive PowerShell shell. You've got monitors, you've got the registry editor, the ability to add roles and features. There's a device manager. Um, really quite a nice environment. And I wish I could show it to you. Next, we have what's called the emergency managing console. So you say, okay, well, wait a second here. So I have this nano server. I like that story. Small, fast, efficient, that's awesome. Uh, only install the things you want. There's no local logon, no local logon, huh? So what happens if something's wrong with the networking? What do I do with that? Well, we have the emergency management console. Emergency management console is available uh, from uh, VM Connect or through the serial port. Uh, and what it does is it provides, you know, sort of basic configuration, the ability to deal with an emergency, uh, shows you where you are, computer name, the domain, uh, IP configuration, and you can modify networking and firewalls. So, let's take a look. Oh no, I forgot to start my virtual machine. Well, let's start that. This might take a while, so maybe you wanna, uh, let's see, maybe you wanna do nothing because it's already running. <laughs> it's wonderful, nano server, it starts so fast, it's a glorious thing. Okay. By the way, you wanna see that again? Didn't believe me, did ya? Let's just turn that thing off. Okay, ready? All right, let's start this. Oh. <laughs> oh, hubris, hubris. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so this is the uh, emergency management console. So you see I've got my computer name, it's on a work group, what OS I'm running, technical preview five, so you've seen a little bit of preview other people haven't seen, uh, date and time. We've got networking, uh, firewall rules, outbound firewall rules, WinRM, and down here you can shut it down or you can restart, do you wanna see it again? I'll show you that later. <laughs> so. Here, you know, here's the keys. You see now we got that carrot, shows you where it is. Someone asked me, they said, hey, um, could, you, uh, uh, could you make this more friendly to people who are colorblind? I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so now we use both black and white, for those of you who are, those of you who are colorblind. <laughs> and we have this little carrot there to show you where you are. So we'll select this. Uh, here, if you had multiple adapters, you could select the multiple adapters. And here you see the state of this, uh, what MAC address you have, the fact that you got your enabled, DHCP enabled, subnet mask. And here you can modify routing tables, so F10. You can add routing tables. You can add a route, delete a route. Escape brings you back. Um, we can go into IPv4 settings or V6 settings. Right now that's just DHP, DHCP enabled. Um, and you can enable and disable this, um, this toggle is the ability to enable or disable it. Okay, so we'll go back, take a look at the firewall rules, take a look at the firewall rules, shows you the details again, enable or disable them. And if you want to, you can reset WinRM. Always a good thing to do. Okay. 
And again, if you didn't believe me, control F6, restart. I just love that thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mic drop. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? I just love that thing. All right. Especially when it doesn't blow up on me. Okay. So that's great. And, and in case my demos didn't work, there's a screenshot for you. <laughs> I'm a belts and suspenders kind of guy. Okay. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. But what about PowerShell? Okay, so we on Nano Server, we have PowerShell Core. PowerShell Core. It is a refactored version of PowerShell to run on .NET Core. Uh, it's got the full PowerShell language and remoting. Okay, so you know, invoke command, new PS session, all that works from and to Nano Server. It has most of the core engine components, uh, and it has support for all script types except for workflows. So .NET, you know, C# -sharp scripts, .NET scripts, uh, .NET commandlets, script commandlets, sim commandlets, they all work. Workflow commandlets currently do not work. That's the one uh, core comp engine component that I was m mentioning. Who's and you me. You can still run workflows against Nano Server. You just can't run workflows on Nano Server at this point. So we have a, a limited set of commandlets, but this is growing fast. When we started this, I'll tell you that, uh, what did we end up with the first version? There was like 85 commandlets, and then a couple weeks later we had 185, and it's been growing pretty rapidly since. Honestly, right here we've been uh, uh, sort of gated by the .NET Core, and as it's been uh, getting more and more uh, uh, coverage, this is, number's been growing rapidly. Ooh. Anybody want to see that? Okay, now here's the thing. You're sort of going to be bored. You're going to like, well, it's PowerShell. Yeah, it's PowerShell. So prepare to be bored a little, but it's fun. Okay, so nothing too crazy different. Okay, so right now I've got a uh, session connected to this, this uh, device. This device is, um, is Nano Server. Okay, so that device... Oh, no, sorry. That's my device. There, I'm there. Now, do an enter PS session. And now I've connected to JPS TP5, technical preview 5. Um, and now I do a version table. You see PowerShell, sorry. Sorry, in the back room, i got to make this a little bit smaller. <laughs> a little bit smaller. <laughs> oh, well, whatever. Okay, so anyway, so you see the, the version, and notice here, PowerShell Edition Core. So we've added an addition to tell you what version you're on. Okay, so now let's take a look at the, the modules. Oh, sorry, I've got to make this smaller. This looks like crap. Okay, so, sorry in the back of the room. So here are the modules I have running, okay? Some I downloaded, and then look at this. AppX, Sim, Containers, Containers, Defender, DISM, DNS Client, Event, HG, oh, yeah, HGS, Diagnostics, iSCSI, Hyper-V, PowerShell, all the net stuff, uh, PKI, a whole bunch of stuff. So sort of the stuff you're used to. Now take a look at commands. Clear, take a look at the commands. That's a pretty good list, right? Anybody missing some? Is there one you're missing? Okay, so no complaints. This was the list then. Okay, so let's just see. By the way, I don't think I have everything installed, but I have a pretty good set installed here. So I got 1,248, and that's obviously a subset. There's a bunch of server components that we don't have running. Yes, yeah, so the question is, why is it uh, that uh, you can't use this when you're locally connected to the machine? Uh, there's a couple answers to that. The biggest answer to that is uh, that the .NET Core console code wasn't there. That's the answer. So right, you got to write to the screen, et cetera. Those APIs weren't available. 
So okay. it's a, there's a possibility that, uh, it, you know, one, we're not done showing you TP5, and uh, this is an area of constant investment. So, by the way, hold on. I think we'll have Q&A at the end, and I don't know whether I'm going to run short or long. And Tobias, you can't run long with Tobias in the room, so, <laughs> like, he's going to give me the hook, so I want to zoom, but hopefully we'll have time at the end. Okay. Well, it's all great, Tobias, seriously. Okay, so then uh, you got the help subsystem. That works. About. All that good stuff works. I would have shown you uh, updating help, but my network doesn't work. I was going to say, hey, you can update the help, uh, grab things, and I would have shown you more about topics, but again, that, that's not working. So then, again, it's just PowerShell, right? So here I'm going to show you get win event, show all the logs, and there's the system log. So I'll clear that out. I'll get the system log. I'll get the last 250 of them, 256. Oh, looking pretty good. Uh, where works just like you'd want. So, hey, get me those where the display name's not equal to information. Okay, so you got warnings and you got errors. Anything else? I'm not sure. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and sort that. Sort it by level, right, which is the level. Uh, sort it by ID and then sort it by created time. And, oh, that looks a little bit nicer, right? So there's the level. Here are all my error ones. And here are all my warning ones. But that's still a little bit goofy. Why don't I go ahead and format it and group it by level name and then just get created time and ID in the message. Right? Oh, okay, there you go. Error, time, ID, message. And that's okay, great. But let's just go ahead and I notice I'm truncating some stuff here. So I can wrap it. Well, that's a little bit better. Uh, and then, well, hey, let's, let's go put that all in a variable. So I'll assign that to dollar sign A, and I take a look at dollar sign A, there's one of the, the errors, one of the events, and if I want to, I can get all of the events, and sort of what I'm showing you here is all the stuff you're familiar with PowerShell all just sort of works, okay? Now, there'll be holes, uh, but you tell us about the holes that hurt you, and, you know, honestly, we got a backlog to fill all the holes, we're going to fill them all. Um, and then you tell us the ones that hurt the most, and those will get higher on the backlog. But yeah, it all sort of works, right? So here are all the messages. And if you want to, well, let's 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 uh, clear that. Let's clear that, and then let's sort the messages, right? All just sort of works. And if you want to, let's go convert it to JSON, right? So JSON objects. Happy days. All sort of works. Okay. Now let's clear this. Classes. Okay, so anybody working with classes? Classes, you like classes? Classes are pretty cool. Okay, so let's just take a regular class, like from a snippet. So control J, let's just grab a simple class. Okay, and let's do it this way, I'll show it this way. So here's the simple class that I just pulled out, did nothing fancy. I'll go and I'll create that class, and then I'll try and call a, a new constructor, because it's type name, type name. I'll call a constructor new. This is a test. Try and run that. Oh, it fails. Why is that? Okay, argument this is a test does not belong to the val1, val2. Oh, wait a second. So let's take a look here. So type name, type name. Uh, where are we here? Oh, here it is. Here's the validate set. Has to be val1 or val2. Oh, okay, so let's try that again. So then. I create it with val1. Happy days. Now I got this dollar sign x. Dollar sign x. Okay, val1. I can invoke methods. I can take a look at all the, the properties. Let's go back to this view. It's a little bit nicer view. I can go look at all the properties. And again, sort of what I'm showing you here is no drama. No drama. Just sort of works. Okay, functions. You know about functions. Let's grab a function here function, uh, my function, hello, PowerShell, see, e e EU, okay, so we'll call that, create it, and then my function, okay, just works, and then workflow, somebody's beeping here, okay, simple workflow, I want to take this workflow, do the same thing. Hello. How's that for hello? 
pretty sad. Okay, so I'll define that workflow and it says workflow is not supported in PowerShell core. Okay, so that's the one big gap that we have at this point. Okay, so that is, that is PowerShell core. Okay, so again, sort of no drama. Now, in order to make this work, now think again, what did I say? Vast majority of computing is ahead of us. It's about mass management. It's about how do I have 100, 1,000, 10,000 computers all working for me, right? You're not going to be, everything, everything has to be automated. Everything has to be automated. It has to be automated remotely, okay? So in the past, that, you know, we, we were, automation was really important. But honestly, now we live or die based upon our automation, okay? Uh, you know, I don't know if you ever heard the story about Cortez the Explorer. Cortez the Explorer, you know, he takes this long, arduous journey to cross the Atlantic, gets to the New World, and it's just a terrible thing. And his men are like, oh, that was horrible. This place stinks. We don't like this place. We want to go back home. He's like, yeah, no. And he burned his ships. <laughs> and he said, we're going to make it here. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Sort of we didn't, we always had our ships. Whenever we said, oh, well, we should do this for remoting, it's like, yeah, but, you know, they can always RDP in and blah, blah, blah. And so there was always this sort of escape route. As important as it was, there was always this escape route. And there was a number of things that we knew we should do, but we didn't. Nano server, there's no option. You know, if, it, if you can't do it remotely, you can't do it. And so it's forcing us to get better at remoting. Okay? Number one, PS Direct. PS Direct is PowerShell remoting over a VM bus transport. So anybody played with VS Direct? Just a few. So let me play, say that again. PowerShell Direct is PowerShell remoting, but instead of going over HTTP, it goes over the VM bus. Okay? Crazy cool stuff. PS Edit. Now PS Edit works remotely. We have remote debugging. You saw some of that today. Well, actually, you didn't see some of that today. Hopefully, my demos will work. Um, we have remote show command. So show command now works remotely. Uh, we've improved our coverage. So you saw there device manager now works remotely. Why? Because we now have commandlets that work against that. Uh, in the past, it's like, yeah, but now we have to do that. So we're improving our coverage. Uh, and you can do file copy over PSRP, okay? It's crazy good stuff. And in the future, coming up, we are working in, with the OpenSSH community. The PowerShell team, in fact, is the ones leading that. And OpenSSH, both the client and the server, will be available on uh, Windows uh, shortly. It's actually, you know what, it's available now, it's just not ready now. <clears throat> it's available in GitHub, and you can go take a look at the code. We have distributions. You can kick the tires today. Uh, but in the future, you know, be available in a more supported way. Okay, so, again, let's pray a little, little sacrifice to the demo gods. Let's show you some of that remoting wonderfulness. Okay, so, again, show you the version. We're running on the core version. Okay. Oh, yeah, enter. I'm already connected. Okay, so now let's do this. Sorry, let's do this. Let's say exit. So now I'm back in the desktop. I say show command, <clears throat> and you'll see all the, all the uh, modules that I have commandlets for. Okay. So now when I say enter PS session, Watch what happens to that. Just please wait. So what's happening now is we're talking to the remote connection and we're finding out what its capabilities are. And so now these are all the modules from that remote machine. Okay, so if I wanted to, you can do the, all the good stuff, star process, process, get process, you know, star SS. And you've got the GUI, but it's working now against the remote machine. So ISE, the graphical user interface of show command, now works remotely. Happy days. We have this new thing called, how do we 
can you see this? Let's try this. There we go. We have this new thing called local accounts. Okay. Uh, get local group. Yeah, finally. <laughs> the story behind this is so sad. <laughs> it took us so long to do. Okay. Yeah, truly pitiful. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so there's all those. Uh, local get local user. Okay, you want a new local user? Let's say, hey, Tobias. Tobias. Uh, he's now a local user. What password? Oh, that's not pass equals read host as a secure string. By the way, I don't know if you knew this. You can uh, you can put uh, variables in uh, show command. Everybody know that? Yeah. So anyway, this requires a, a a secure string, so I had to get it here. But anyway, so now we'll go add Tobias as a as a user. Get local users. There's Tobias. I can add him into the admin account. I'm not going to do that. But anyway, so now we <laughs> we've improved the coverage. Yeah. Uh, so now check this out. Check this out. This is crazy. PMP devices, PMP commandlets, okay? So get the PMP devices. There are all the PMP devices. If I want, I get a particular device, right? Sort it by status, okay? Error, these devices, okay, these, unknown these. Here I'll go uh, get each one of the instances, okay? get those whose friendly names are like volume manager. Again, wildcards work because I'm a really crappy typist. Okay, and then you can pipe that to get all the properties. So there's all your PMP properties. And if you know the property you want, like the device stack, you can access that. And if you want, you can just get the data, get that as a list. So PMP finally, again, coverage. If you can't do it remotely, you can't do it. So that's driving us to do a better job of our coverage. Okay. Now, Defender, bunch of stuff on Defender. Get the MP status, shows you the status of where you are, what your level of your uh, uh, threats are, what the level of your updates are. And here I would show you, well, actually, let's do this. Uh, do a dir. Okay, so there's this thing here, this demo, that, that looks interesting, what's that about? And so I'll just do a PS edit of it, and now look here. Okay, so now let's be clear here. Now I'm editing a file from a remote machine on my local ISC. So notice up here, up here, it says remote file, T, TP5, whatever. So I brought the file over. I'm doing local editing. If I want to, I'll say, I wonder if this really works. And we'll save it. Oh, save it. And now, cat. should be up there. I wonder if it really works. There you go. So now watch what happens when I exit. Watch this, the tab goes away. Yeah, because it's not there anymore. Okay, so anyway, so uh, there's some of the, the remoting improvements. Now, what we've done is what I call the dev opsification of, of uh, Windows of Windows. Okay, so in the past, uh, you know, Windows great operating system, but we provided a set of APIs, and then we were silent about the contract between developers and operators, and that let a thousand blossoms bloom. But in reality, what it did was it set up the world for a lot of conflict. Okay, there were too many ways to do things and set people up for conflict. Uh, so now, in Windows Server 2016, we finally resolved the interface between developers and operators. There's architecture that says, hey, developer, you produced an XE? You are not done, my friend. Don't put down that keyboard. Don't go home yet. There's more work to do. You're, you were going to do that stuff anyway, but you didn't know what? We're going to be very clear about things you should do. Okay? And 
So basically, we're now supporting two operations model. There is the traditional operations model that everybody here knows and breathes and lives. That's the traditional model. There is a new emerging operational model based upon containers, and that's really the way you want to think about it. You do a lot of the same things using the traditional model, but then you capture them in a container and you do them slightly differently. Okay? We support both of these models going forward. Now, what's that actually mean? We are defining how to package things, okay? Uh, and we have, we're using that using WSA. WSA is the uh, Windows App X platform. App X is the installer for the client and store applications. And what we're doing is we're extending that for server features, right? So a client application that comes from the store does not install services, does not register WMI providers, uh, does not set up event counters. Server applications do. So we take their XML schema. It turned out the Epix framework is an extensible framework already. We extend it for server semantics. Next is package management. We're being clear about how to do package management. When you produce your artifacts and package them this way, you should put them in these repositories. Here's how you get those repositories. Here's how you put them in public repositories. Here's how you set up a private repository, either put your own stuff there or curate stuff from public repositories that you've signed off on and you tell people, hey, don't go install everything from anywhere. You get it from mine because we're, we're standing behind it. We're being clear about configuration. We started in, this the, in the previous release. We're getting very hardcore and great support for that in this release, and that's, of course, desired state configuration. In the past, sort of like, yeah, you should configure things. How? Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever. Now we're being very clear about how to do it. Operational validation testing with Pester. Okay, so there's Pester for testing your code. That's great, love it. But there's also Pester for being able to test your environment. Again, where's the guy? Here's, what's your, you gotta give everybody a pointer to your blog. It was a great blog. And it just said, it's like exactly, yeah, stand up a second. Yeah. What's your name? I can't read it. You guys should talk to this guy, find him at the party tonight, buy him a beer. He's got a great blog, and I tell you, it's one of the, my favorite blogs the last quarter, where he did exactly what I'm hoping the world gets to, right? You change something, and you run these operational validation tests, and said, this is working Active Directory, I've been able to do this, I'm able to contact these things, and you know where you are. Uh, just, it, it engineers confidence into your operations. Right now, we run our, our operations with like hope and, and a rabbit's foot, right? I change something, I hope nothing's broken. You know, hang up by the phone for a while. If it doesn't break, I get to go home. Not the way we want to be. And of course, secure operations with just in time, which is uh, you're an admin, but just for a small amount of time, or just enough, which is, hey, you're not an admin, but on these machines for these operations, I'll give you the ability to run those operations as an admin, okay? So both of those. And then of course, container and Docker. Burr, I'm running out of time. Now there are limitations to .NET. Uh, the biggest one right now is .NET Core. Uh, .NET Core is a version one. And honestly, it's been accelerating. It's going to do great. It is the strategic investment uh, going forward. Uh, but we have a lot of refactoring work to do. So that is it. There's a number of commandlets today that need full.NET, uh, which is to say they require components that are .NET that have not been refactored to .NET Core. So those aren't available. Uh, PowerShell workflows, I mentioned to you, are not available. And we do have a coverage gap. And the coverage gap is twofold. One is stuff that we should be able to do, given the resources that we, given the uh, platform that we have available to us. We just haven't gotten to it. You'll see TP5 is much better than TP4. You'll see the next version, you know, the final release is better than that. Um, but there'll be some gaps. And then there's some gaps because of lacking of the underlying um, uh, uh, platform support. And again, I showed you how to detect it. Uh, we are going to be telling you uh, uh, how to go find modules that will support Nano Server, um, and in particular, Core. Okay, so now let's recap. PowerShell Core is all about cloud competitiveness, being great in the cloud, 
right? We got to be small. We got to be fast. We have to be DevOps friendly. Uh, you got to minimize the attack surface, and you need to minimize reboots and patches. That's why we've done Nano Server. That's why we've done the remote management tool, the emergency management console, why we've done PowerShell Core, and why we've done this new layer of technology that defines the interface between developers and operators, a new packaging way to package your components, a way to manage those package with package management, desired state configuration, pester, GIA, containers, and the Docker management APIs. This is the most fundamental change to the Windows Server architecture since NT. This lays down the architectural foundation for Windows Server as a cloud operating system really for the next 10 to 20 years. It is that dramatic. And yet, don't be frightened by that. If you're one of those guys, I know none of you are, but if at home you've got a fellow admin that just loves to walk up to a machine and is dying for the day, he can speak to it and say, hey Cortana, please start IIS, that world continues to exist for whatever it's worth. <laughs> now, here's the other point. Nano server and core PowerShell make full server and full PowerShell better. Those commandlets are available to that. The remoting is available to that. Actually, I didn't even show that one. Oh, I, I gotta show you this one, sorry. Sorry, Tobias. I might have to run late. I had to show this one. How could I not have shown this one? This is crazy. Okay, so dollar sign S. Sorry, just got to show this. So look at this. Okay, so that's my C directory on that remote drive. Okay, so now what I'll do is take a look at my local drive, C temp. Look at all this stuff. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy to session. Okay. So now when I do this, look on the remote machine, now I've got a temp drive. And when I do this, voila. So now you have file transfer over that. Now again, I needed to do that for nano server, but it's gonna help full server and full windows. So, you know, it makes it better, right? Forces us to get better. And we don't have time for Q&A, I think. <laughs> do we? Okay, well we got a whole panel session, but okay, well I can take a few questions or comments. Richard. Okay. One more, one moment. <laughs> you mentioned that you're tagging modules for core edition. If it's tagged as core, will it still run on full? Say again? You, you showed, Put this you, closer. Showed, you showed quickly on the, um, edition. the repository and the edition oh, yeah. and where you're tagging the module that mm -hmm. is core. Is that a restriction so that it only runs on core or is it has to be tagged like that to run on core? No, the tag is really just to find things, not to the restriction. We'll have a, what, do we have a pound sign requires well, we for core? We have a variety of requirements. We're going to have additions. We'll have additions? The language is the same everywhere, so the tag will be tagging additions, which additions is targeted for. Yeah. It works on multiple that you'll have multiple tags. Exactly. So the point there was, you know, you'll have additions, you'll have tags, and it'll be possible, in fact, we expect over time, most scripts will be able to run on both uh, core and the full edition, and what you'll end up doing is tag and full. But that'll take a while. And by the way, that's the other thing is, as uh, contributors, uh, we would like you to pick up the latest Technology Preview 5, that'll be available in a few weeks, uh, and start kicking the tires on Nano Server. Tell us what gaps we have. Uh, take your stuff and get it running on that and republish uh, to the to the uh, repository, telling people that you work on Nano Server. Any other questions? Yes, sir. If you shout it, I'll repeat it. It'll go faster. Actually, I have two questions. Um, the first question is: um, <laughs> Is uh, the local user module going to be backported to Server 2012? Oh. Uh, what do we decide about? Th yeah, uh, yes. The answer is it's available in the latest version of Windows, and I believe what we're going to do is we're going to take the user module and we're going to put it in the gallery for down level. Okay, great. Is that, is that, did I get into trouble there, Kenneth? Oh, 
<laughs> oh, excellent. I'm not in trouble. That's the intent. And the second question is um, the commands that are available on nano server, um, do they have a feature parity to the regular PowerShell commands on the st standard Windows server or do they oh, differ? Feature parity. Um, I, I mean, just like the completeness of, of uh, available parameters. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know that any that aren't. Yeah. I'm sure that there are, but I don't. Yeah. I can hear them. So, so our goal, so first off, on, on Nano, lang the language is exactly the same. So uh, if you're just using language features, you're fine. If you're using classes and so forth that aren't there on Nano, then you're not fine. Correct. But uh, in terms of our commandlets, the goal is to be completely compa compatible for the ones that are, not, are there. Not everything's there, but for the ones that are there, like all the file system and so forth, should be identical. We want it, you should be able to take a script and relatively easily within a certain domain make it portable across all of the additions. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. It turns out now, an interesting turn of events, that for maximal portability, you want to write your commandlets in PowerShell because we're the interpreter, we can run it. Next year I'll explain more fully what that means. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> <laughs> she knows how to use the microphone. <laughs> I like that. I remember a time installing Telnet server from the servers for Unix and I was very happy and the Unix guys told me, well, we have SSH, <laughs> and it did make me happy. Uh, now we have PowerShell remoting. What's the fuzz about supporting SSH? Oh, so the, what's the fuzz about SSH? So there's a couple things. First off, um, again, we want our customers. So here's the thing you got to get in focus, right? Again, strategy motivations. Look, plans change all the time. Motivations don't. So what's our motivation? What you need to understand is that in the context of Azure, huge strategic business for Microsoft, um, I earn more money if there are 10 instances of Linux than if there's one instance of Windows, okay? So what that means is it's a volume game. Let me be super crisp here. With Windows Azure, we seek to run the entire world's workloads on our public cloud whether those workloads are Windows or Linux, okay? What that means is we want to have there be no friction for anyone to consume the natural, very large amount of computing, whether it's one workload or another. That's why we, we want to say, hey, if you're on a Linux box, client or server, and you want to manage Windows, we want to make that easy to do via SSH. If you're on a Lin Windows box and you want to manage your Linux stuff, client or server, we want to be able to do that via SSH. Now then there's a separate topic that we discuss of, hey, once I have this SSH protocol, can we do PowerShell remoting more efficiently? PowerShell remoting is not the most efficient protocol. It was one of those, hey, if you want to ship, you're going to salute this flag and do this. If you actually take a look at the PowerShell remoting program, it's a shell protocol. You start off, you have HTTP, you put web services. WSMAN is HTTP implemented with web services. Did you catch that? That's what it is. And then PowerShell remoting is a, a interactive shell layer on top of that. So there's opportunities to, to refactor that stack with a little more efficiency, something that's a little more optimized. So that is not a plan, but that's something that we look at and say, huh, that's an interesting conversation. Yes. But again, the motivation here, and again, now next year is going to be a more interesting conversation than this year, is our mission to eliminate the friction to being able to consume all the computing you want, whether that's Windows or other OSs. Right, right. That's the so, mission. So basically, you could describe Azure as being OS agnostic. It is. Correct. Something you never thought you'd hear from Microsoft. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, it's, yeah, it's true. 
And again, I like to put it in the business context, right? Look, Bruce and I, you know, we're a long time, you know, our backgrounds are Unix. We like Unix, et cetera. But we're not doing it because uh, we like Unix. We're doing it because it makes business sense for the company, right? It's as simple as that. That's why we do things. Okay, should we do the panel? The reason why I'm so relaxed um, regarding the schedule is because this is the best speakers Q&A we can have. <laughs> you can ask questions and Jeffrey's answering them. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Jeffrey, I think uh, what we do is simply um, you can just uh, close your session and get your computer off and so the girls can take the stuff because then uh, while you do this, um, I would like to ask all the